You know, I drive into the studio. Well, yes, you call it no. jackassing into the studio. No? I, I wanted to, yes, I do. I actually call it jackassing in the studio. And what do I do? I typically listen to music. And I always, when I listen to my music, I try to sort of get a title for a show. So indulge me all for a second, if you may. Danny just rolled his eyes. No, I'm loving it. can't see that. No, you're not loving it. So I'm going to start saying famous Jacksons. There's a reason for this, okay? I mean, Janet Jackson, yeah. for example. Yeah. Michael Jackson. Yep. Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson. Remember him. Andrew Jackson was a president, right? Jackson Pollock. Randy Jackson. Jermaine Jackson. Jermaine Jackson. Tito Jackson. Tito Jackson. Mark Jackson. But in 19... Mark Jackson. But in 1977, I was probably 13 years old. Reggie Jackson. Jackson Brown. No. Please. I had it running okay. on empty. Okay. By the way, uh, you're listening to the On The Tape podcast. I'm Guy Adami. Danny Moses chirping. Dan Nathan contributing to the Jackson conversation. But today, we are joined by the great Tony Dwyer, chief market strategist at Canaccord Genuity. Little known fact. Middle, middle name of Tony Dwyer. Jackson. Jackson. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> DJ, welcome. Yeah. Welcome, Tony. Yeah. Jim, now, and El, now, Jim and Ellen just, just rolled over up in Marcellus. how I got there. Okay? Yeah. Jackson Brown. Now, all these Johnsons, by the way, by the time you're listening- Married to, to Daryl Hannah from the movie Wall Street? What, for a brief period of time. Okay. All right. Keep going. It, wasn't, it didn't go particularly well. But as you're listening to this, all those geniuses are going to be where? Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Oh. Right? Mm. That's where they're going to be. They're all going to be talking. Oh, that's great. Good for them. But took by the way- minutes. Jackson Hole is beautiful, as you know, but there's a lyric in the song, Running on Empty, okay? Running on Empty, Tony. I don't know when that road turned onto the road I'm on. The road I'm on, Danny Moses has been on, Dan Nathan, we've been on the bearish road. Well, isn't it an echo chamber guy? No, oh. it's not an echo chamber. Not when it's the truth, Dan. That's when it, not when yeah. it's the truth. <laughs> okay. And now, see, we've been on this road, and I got to tell you something. I don't know when the road turned on to the road I'm on, but I got to tell you all something. It feels to me like there's been the convergence of the roads over the last couple of days. Thoughts on that, Danny Moses? I texted Dan yesterday morning a date. Did I not? July 20th. I, no. 2000. That's my birthday. July, July 26, 2000. July 26, 2000. And I've often compared this AI craze to the fiber optic craze of, two, of 99 and 2000. Very similar in the sense of the internet was being built out, you need fiber to do it. AI is being built out, you need chips to do it. I get it, the whole thing. I talked about this before. If you took all the fiber that was being talked about, it could go around the globe 10 times, no one cared. The market caps made no sense, didn't matter. Catching on to a trend. On July 26, 2000, in the midst of the NASDAQ kind of you know, making its peak. And as we all know, it hit the peak, I believe in March of, of 2000, things were still kind of uncertain. JDS Uniface, symbol JDSU, the market cap was around 110, 120 billion at the time, reported a beat and a raise. And that was a big company back then. They made a lot of acquisitions. The stock proceeded to get killed in the aftermarket. By the way, it was trading in 16th. So God, you remember, we teenies as we saw. Yeah. Was, so anyway, to me, we've already seen glimpses of kind of stocks that, you know, running out of buyers. But to me, whether NVIDIA, as we see here today, closes down or not on day, it doesn't matter. The rest of the market had just been waiting for this company to report for what reason and what impact it has on others. I don't know, but it feels to me, this is the moment of July kind of 2000, where now things are going to start to come in. We've already seen fits and starts with that, but this is why I tell people, it's not that we want to be bearish or whatever, but our experiences, I sat on those desks then. I felt the mood swings then. I felt, you could feel it. It's the same type of thing of people. And I want to make one other comment. And Tony, welcome to on the tape. I'm, obviously, you're, we're, we're here to talk to you. Um, but I want to close the chapter on the meme stocks here. And the reason I want to close the chapter is, obviously, it's over. Um, AMC went through the iteration of getting the, the share of Suinch approved. The stock got killed. It split one for 10. It's already down again. By the way, as a side note, reverse splits never work. 99% of stocks end up going down, but that's a whole nother segment. So I was talking to someone, Jay Brown, actually not talking, texting with. He was on the John Stewart show with me a couple years ago. We did the story on the meme stocks. And he was one of the original AMC guys, bought the stock. And I'll promise I'll wrap this up in a second. Bought the stock. And a lot of the GameStop and AMC people believed that the market's rigged, that you know shorts were controlling things, that reg show. And 
And there's some truth to the fact the market wasn't functioning great. But here's the problem. Now that the cult has, has been broken, the stock price, they're, they're upset and blaming other people. Other, it was right in front of you. And my point is this. Fundamentals at the end of the day, all the other noise is, is, you know, is noise. Fundamentals matter. They want to blame short sellers. They want to blame this. At the end of the day, as we sit here today, I realize, and I'll close it out here, Tesla, I've always said, is the ultimate meme stock. It had everything. I realize now after going through the GameStop and the AMC and the people that it's a religion, it's not, it doesn't trade on fundamentals, what's happening overall. It's not just Tesla's other stocks in the market. Anyway, my point is this. It's time to break away from the cult and look at things objectively, and that's all we're trying to yeah, do Yeah, well, the so. only problem is with the Tesla as it got you know to $800 billion in market cap. It was over $1 trillion in late 2021. You know, it's it's actually embedded. It's in the matrix, if you think about it, because it's in the S and P 500. It's one of the largest market cap companies in the world. And the same thing for an Nvidia. And I'll just say this before we kick it over to Tony a little bit. Um, I remember a day in early 2000, we had an analyst on our desk who had worked as an engineer in the optical networking space. No shit. We hired him in 1999. And I remember one day because JDSU, he was riding it the whole way up, and the stock gapped up like nvidia gapped up today and he stood up on the desk and he said the market will never go down again we did I not have this God. conversation before we got in here just for the record we did we not, did not. We, i did not know that no, and that's unbelievable i know and yeah. i've told this story on the podcast <laughs> before and for years later on our trading desk this guy didn't make it far into the year 2000 as you guys can imagine um, so I tell that story. Why do we talk about these names? Because it's sentiment's really important. Okay. And, and so we're going to bookmark this a little bit. We talked about that week in July 18th when Microsoft announced their co-pilot pricing of their AI tools. And that was it. The stock made a new all-time high, went up 5% in a straight line, and then it sold off and has barely seen an uptick since then. I think you can bookend this. It's this is Thursday into the close. If NVIDIA closes down on the day after gapping up 10% to a new all-time high, $1.2 trillion market cap. And so, you know, listen, we talk about this because sentiment is really important. Tony, you use analogs a lot. You've been in the market for a long time. You're a strategist. You try to divorce yourself from some of the single stock manias and, and the stuff that we just spent five minutes talking about here. But are you starting to see some similarities? You talk to some of the smartest people in the business who deploy, you know, billions of dollars in capital, right? Making directional bets, that sort of thing. You know, talk to us about, are, are we... Are we, are we leaning too much into our experience from past bubble periods? It's not, I don't think it, thank you for having me here, but I don't think it's necessary to make the comparison to the catastrophe. It could just be bad. What was a catastrophe? Like 00 to 03. No, catastrophe then, was 08. Right? And then, oh, I was going to say. Yeah, that's not. So let me tell you a quick story. Yeah. So Danny, in the movie, you know, yeah. Vince is. Big short Vince movie. Vince has, is carrying around a bat, right? Yeah. So. I was the guy that you guys, as you know, called in because it was feeling so wrong. Why is the market going up so much yeah. in the face of what we know to be true? Yep. Now, frankly, you guys saved me at the end of the day. I got negative in, in the first week of 08, first day of 08. But ultimately during 2007, the first half of 2007, you know, I went in there and Vince held his bat up and said, let's, let's get the bull. And we'd go into the conference room and you'd beat the crap out of me for about an hour. And we'd, and we'd have a good, not a good, yeah, we'd have a good time going back and forth because it felt the market just kept going up regardless of what was happening. So when it comes to feelings like that, um, I almost got fired in 99. I got, you know, I wrote a note called Cash is King at the firm I was at at the time and in, in end of September 99. Went up 30% in my face. Like I felt pretty dumb this July. Um, I but felt, Tony, I'm go just going to so. interrupt you one yeah. second. There was one thing in common with 2000 and 2007. That's where rates, rates yeah. were being jacked. And it's the one thing. Right. And so when you look at how to price an equity with what's the proper discount rate, what's the proper risk adjusted return. That's right. That so here people have, you know, can allocate risk free at 5% or keep chasing this stuff. Anyway, I didn't interrupt, well, but well, there are similarities there. It's not just a coincidence. Well, that, let's look the, at what's, let's look at, so the soft landing scenario, which is very popular and the, the weaker economic data. Here's the problem I have with that right now, guys. Like, you know me, I'm historically kind of more bullish than mm -hmm. bearish. And that's, by the way, that's the right way to be. That's historic. generally been. So what, when I get bearish, as you guys know, is when there's not a great outlook for money. So what I did is I went back just to, you know, I, I did the 11 o'clock show on CNBC. I just looked at 10 year note yield from the end of 94 to the beginning of 96, that soft landing bull market, the 10 year note yield went from 8% to five and a half. 
Then I went back to 1966 and you get the same kind of interest rate move. At some point, if you're in an economic fear-based backdrop where things are slowing, nominally they are, you've, the only th why does the market bottom in a recession? Because the outlook for money improves. You don't worry about how bad it is now because you know because the Fed is easing and interest rates are tanking, the refi cycle is going to kick in. You know that outlook. high yield rates are coming down. Corporate rates are coming down. It allows cheaper access to money. It's opposite day right now. The 10 year, all interest rates are going up at or where they were a year ago, whether it's the yield to worst on the high yield, Bloomberg high yield market, whether it's we know the mortgages are at a new cycle high, and we know that interest rates are at a new cycle high. So, how do you have the most levered system in history on a debt to GDP, the Fed raising rates in a historic way in history, and it's going to be okay? You can't. And okay, so here, here's the buffer. Private credit. I think what most people, myself included throughout this cycle, I think that's what, at least for now, that might get pushed out because of that. But I think that there has been a buffer. If, if you didn't have private credit and private equity taking some of this bad data off, uh, bad bonds off the banks that the regional banks that have failed, and then they had to send that into the public market, I think we'd have a different price on bonds. So there is kind of like this, what happened in 07, what happened in, there's this like, I don't want to say invisible hand, it makes it sound so nefarious. It's just another entity that's not regulated, that's acting as a buffer for now. But there was $8.4 trillion left still in the Fed balance sheet, of which the majority is treasuries. And so in an unnatural way, rates are staying higher as they're selling those. That's, that's what's different this time. And what I'd like to do for, for the um, podcast viewers, listeners, is this. Let's explain what quantitative tightening is in real time. So the mortgage spreads, typically you have a mortgage spread, according to my friend Ivy Zellman, who I call the queen of home building. I know um, Ivy. We love Ivy. I, I, I love Ivy. Ivy um, sent me a chart. The chart is the spread between 30-year fixed rate mortgage, national average, and the 10-year note yield. It's historically between 170 and 175 basis, 175 basis points. So that's 1.75%. Currently at 300 because the biggest buyer of mortgages was the Fed. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a chart of the balance sheet of the Fed and how it's been dwindling since they started quantitative tightening, excluding that one moment with uh, SF, SV, SVB, you're in a situation where you lost your biggest buyer. And the result of that is that you've got this blown out spread. Mm -hmm. So that's the negative side. What's the positive side of that trade? When the Fed does start to ease, and I think they're going to be aggressive. If this thing starts to go south, well, when you say this thing, what is the, this the thing? economy? When like we're we're seeing it in the retailers, you have okay. excess inventories, you have um, margin pressure, credit and now, card, and now you're having delinquencies and you get, credit you card. You're, you're having all those things that happen, guys. We're in a microwave market in a slow cooker economy. When I got into TV before, you know, back when you know, guy was only like thirty back mm. then. Well, Thomas. Uh, and in the early 1990s, it was me and Larry Wachtel on Financial News Network, FNN. There was no CNBC. There was nobody telling you every two minutes that right. we're going to go into recession because the yield curve inverted. We're inundated with information, whether it's X, formerly known as Twitter, whether it's everything. 15 news channels, minute to minute, have breaking news from Tony Dwyer, Kenicord Genuity. The yield curve inverted every three seconds. It makes it feel like it's different. It's not different. It may be taking longer in the great financial crisis from the initial inversion of the, of the yield curve to the actual recession was 21 months. The median is 11. So what do you think was happening at 16, 17 months? Yeah, Danny, Vince, and team are calling me in to beat the crap out of me because why hasn't it happened yet? It t sometimes when there's more leverage and there's private areas that are, f that are, you know, buffering it to take advantage of initial weakness, you get, you get it pushed out a little so bit. So real quickly, um, was the baseball that bat thing that was real and, and was that, uh, uh like baseball bat was, was that real. an Al Capone sort of Robert De Niro untouchables sort of thing? Remember that, remember that scene? Yeah, you remember I that like scene. baseball. Yeah. I want to say that, like, well, I, we had two bats in the office. Because we know that Vinny's listening, so I just we, right. we have to have this I think it was a Redwood Trust bat. If really? I, I, oh, I feel like, like it might have like been. swag from like other Yeah, I think bag. we had one swag and then I had one yeah. uh, that was okay, just, to me, but, but yeah. the guy you saw what I was doing there, right? There was yeah. no yeah. greater yeah. team. Like the, th the idea of being in an echo chamber is disgusting to me. And you guys aren't. You talk about it or whatever, but like it's, it's, real, it. it's real stuff. I would go into their office 
And they were the smartest guys in the room. Forget about Danny sitting here. I learned an incredible amount. The best thing that can happen to somebody like me is you ask a question. It's when you say, oh, geez, you're right. That's great stuff. That's when we're dead. That's the echo chamber. Well, Guy and I have gotten to know all three of those guys pretty well over the last few years. And it's interesting. I can't imagine you guys would agree on much for much of the time. I, I would imagine that the best trades, the best ideas came out of you guys battling each other. Oh, it was a challenge. But it was the one thing we all agreed on was what we were seeing in that. It was the greatest. It was the greatest conversation that an analyst and and I think somebody that wants to be thoughtful, I'm not going to put myself in a smart guy camp, that wants to be thoughtful is to not be, to be respectfully challenged, not, not to, you know, be disrespectfully challenged, but to be challenged. Like, why is it this way? Why isn't it like 07 yet? Why isn't it going to be a soft landing? Those are good. All questions. right. So give us a sense. What, what, what is your, so let's do markets and we'll do the economy. What, what, what is your market view right now? And what's changed if anything over the last few months? So since the beginning of the year, we came in, our, our market view was light and tight. Like the time to be super negative, like bet on the downside was last summer because you knew the fed was raising 75 ba- basis points at a clip. And he was very clear. He had the eight minute Jackson Hole speech, Mr. Jackson. Mm-hmm. He had the eight minute Jackson Hole speech, right? That was clear. That's what created that whoosh. Now, then you get the, I called it the fall, fall at the time. Again, felt like an idiot in early August last year. Markets going up 2% a day on some news that was good until it didn't. And that I think is the, it goes to the structure of the market. So light and tight just means held, held a little extra cash. Because I want to, when bad news becomes bad news, remember there's three stages. When the uh, good news is bad news means tighter Fed. Bad news is good news means Fed's going to stop and it's going to be okay. Soft landing. You want to, I have a great new research analyst. His name is Google. Right. And, and you can Google Ben Bernanke, soft landing, Alan Greenspan, soft landing, Janet Yellen, soft landing. You pick your Fed chair and put soft landing, you'll find an article. Right. So. It, light and tight. You wait, so you get bad news is good news. Good news is um, good news is bad news. Bad news is good news, and finally, bad news becomes bad news. Okay, and that's he, when you want to start to. Here's up on it. here's the difference that I see, and I'm not again not suggesting I'm right. For the people you mentioned, none of them had to contend with inflation. There were no inflationary pressures whatsoever. If the Fed were to, for whatever reason, start to cut again. That inflation genie, which, by the way, is out of the bottle again. I think it's going to reaccelerate in the fall. We've talked about that. It's only going to get that much worse. So they might be cutting for reasons unknown. To your point, the economy might be going pear-shaped. Something happens in the credit market. I don't know. But if they were to do that, the inflation they're trying to combat is going to come back with an effing vengeance. Thoughts? Well, that, and that's that's Powell's comment is he doesn't want to be Arthur Burns. He'd rather be no, He'd rather be Paul Volcker. That's when I got really nervous last year. I started going from perma bull to sounding like a perma bear. Mm-hmm. And that's when he said he wanted to be Paul Volcker. If you look at the amount of debt that exists now, it was a generational low of debt to GDP when Paul Volcker inverted the curve and created one of the worst recessions of all time. So, you know, fast forward to today, we have a generational high in debt to GDP. But here's, so here's the, that sounds like, oh my God, we're all going to zero. Here's the other side of that trade. The private credit and private equity guys don't have a yield curve. They get paid to take the money. They don't have a cost of capital. They get paid to take the money. So they can take a so little they're the extra speed, risk. So they're the speed bump right now, but it does, right. they're not the stop sign There is no stop sign. You but, need money to spend money. But Tony, with that, they're lending. Yeah, they're the lender of last resort maybe. Correct. And they're, but they're charging appropriate rates. They have to yep. make a return. So the flip side of that is companies are paying more, and a lot of these companies weren't set up to pay 13, 14, 15 percent. hundred percent. So it's so for plus whatever, whatever the requirement is. Oh, it's great because it's floating rate. Fantastic. Tell them what they've won. Yeah, they, you know, these right. So yeah, you don't have to look. No, no. So, but my point is it. But that slows the economy to the point the guy is making right in terms of 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 what that looks like. But here we have a situation where I believe the Fed won't cut immediately. I believe they'll stop quantitative tightening. Will be one. And the second thing they're going to do, which you think about what's going on with the banks right now, you couldn't have worse timing for what happened with Silicon Valley and all and the regulatory and all the ratio requirements, the capital ratios, right? The banks aren't participating to your point. They're not going to be able to provide the liquidity they have in the past. Their ability to hold treasuries and hold these other securities, right? With the ratios that they have now is not, is, is not as, as, as deep as it once was. I think the Fed will do two things. I think the treasury will change the ratios revert them back for the bank so they can hold treasuries with with the lower capital requirement and the stop QT. I think they'll try to do other things. But to Guy's point, 
you can't be printing money, one, with our debt, and two, with the inflation that's out there. Well, let's so, look at how it actually, in real time, I love this real time stuff instead of the, mm-hmm. that crappy ac- academic stuff. So yeah. here's the real time stuff. When did the bond market start going, going back up in yield? It was the moment that Janet Yellen announced a one third increase in what was expected for the uh, fixed income new issuance, treasury new issuance. But it's also Bank of Japan, just not forget that, but right. yes. So, that was second, Yeah, but it was still, it started when she issued what the treasury was gonna print. You're already paying, I think, uh, according to my friends at Ned Davis, I saw a chart, something like 650 billion plus a year in interest expense. It's about 14% of what the government pays. Correct. It's 42, almost 42% year over year gain. Guys, this, it's a generational high in debt to GDP. This mm-hmm. is not a generational low. So, so what they did, it, it hasn't had enough. The, the government didn't care. They were issuing short-term paper, though. She's issuing 26-week uh, type bills right now. Yeah, because so she's it's at a, a high rate. So you're replacing zero, you know, correct. one with five and a half. But she must and be it doing that. matter thing. when they're not issuing paper. There's too much competition on the, lo- on the long end of the curve. If she starts issuing seven, 10 year paper right Rates now. Rates are going to continue to go higher. Right. So they're playing this game, Tony, to your point. But you're, you're describing a situation that what lever, if you pull a lever right now, there's an effect on the other side. There always is. But this one is, to me, everything's kind of out in the open now. So that's what scares me here. You know, I, and I think it should, it should scare But everyone. you bring up a great point on your, on your note on Monday. And you were talking about the normal cycles that occur. And Dan and I were talking about this yesterday. So most people have fixed mortgages in their homes now and they're okay, right? So it's not going to, so right. you're not seeing this massive impact you normally would on potential higher rates. But the flip side of that is when the Fed starts cutting, you don't get the boon on the, on the other side that you were, that you're talking about. So this is a very unnatural cycle, right? It's been a natural from the very beginning. Anytime global central banks print the money that they do, it's not natural, right? You created something out of nothing. So again, this unwind is we're going to have it and, and maybe it'll just be a painful two to three years or maybe it'll come fast and furious or whatever it's going to be. But couple that with kind of the valuations in the market right now. And my whole thing is just that that risk is still mispriced. That's so, it. So, Stanley, you don't, like I said, we don't have to go to the arm again. It could just be bad. So here, here's what I mean by that. Let's say the Fed, my, my rate's two and seven A's, right? I got, I got an arm, right? I'm basically renting my house, but I got two and seven A's. For me to refi that- But when does that come up? Because I'll buy you, I'm going to buy you. Seven years. I mean, that's good. But yeah. there's no yeah. chance I'm in the house. <laughs> no. so, anyway, so, yeah. so, you know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a seven to one. So okay. I don't really care what happens to rates unless I have to move. We're stuck in the house because can you imagine where the 10, if I got that two and seven A's, you're currently at a seven, call it seven and a quarter. No, golden handcuffs. Anywhere. You right. have golden handcuffs. I have golden, I'm not going anywhere. Right. And, and, and by the way, they would have to cut rates enough to bring the 10 year down below 1% for me to refi. What, what, let me ask you, what hold on one second. Let me ask you a question. It's interesting you say that because I look at it and say, I don't even think it matters what the Fed does with rates now. Those interest rates determined by the market and the banks, I mean, they're going to be a lot stickier going down, in my opinion, regardless of what rates, because more regulation, the banks, the, the, the higher cost of capital, I think they're going to be less inclined to lend. So I hear what you're saying, but I'm hard pressed to believe maybe you go from seven to six, leverage, but if you're right, if we're right, the leverage in this thing, look at what happened on Silicon Valley Bank. The Fed, if you ask them the day before that happened, if they were going to quantitative ease, they would have laughed at They're you. They're still not calling it that, but right, yes. But, but that's, if you look at the balance sheet, of course. it expanded. I don't care what they call it. Oh, what? The balance yes. sheet expanded. So imagine what happens in a difficult, so what's the scenario where that happens? All of a sudden you start to get the unemployment rate to come up. Mm-hmm. Like they just revised in 300,000 less jobs than was previously put in, right? All we see are people, companies laying off, whether it's private or public on the tape. So I, there's such a revision in the payroll data. They actually have a page on the BLS. You can go to the BLS. You can find the page of historical revisions to the payrolls. And it will make, it makes me never, ever give a comment when a mm-hmm. report comes out. But so let's say you get and core inflation is coming from currently four and a half down to three and a half, and the unemployment rate's going up from three and a half to above four. Jerome Powell's going to say inflation's trending in the right direction. The weakness in the employment picture, we want to begin to take into consideration. Take into consideration. Right. So we're going to take our foot off the brake or whatever phrase he wants to use. But to get that real boom going, 
like if if the Fed lowers, here's the here's the positive story down the road. The Fed starts to lower rates. Let's call it 100 basis point just just for mm-hmm. giggles. And you because they stop quantitative tightening, maybe you get new buyers of the mortgage paper, so that spread comes down 100 basis points to normal, not under normal, just normal. All of a sudden, you have a 200 basis point improvement in mortgage rates, which could help increase activity, not refi it, because most people are below 4%, right? We all know the numbers. It's a huge percentage of mortgage holders are below. But what's happening to rents? Because the cap rates need to go up. So rents are going to go up. So forget about owning a home. Guy talks about this all the time from an inflationary perspective. That's coming to a theater near you. I mean, so we're- we're It's a mess. It's a mess. Danny, this situation is a mess. And and I don't, I don't know the, the longer. So my, my comments that have, you know, have been that a soft landing is the worst case, potentially the worst case scenario, because we see exactly what we get. We see the Fed governors and presidents in Jackson Hole saying we're going to keep rates at this level longer, mm-hmm. right? That gives more time for just what happened to the government. They just had to issue paper at five, over 5%. Instead of the 0.5%, because it stayed higher for longer. What do you think is going to happen to corporations? What do you think is going to happen to households? The longer that you keep those rates high, those fo- folks that are forced to turn over their debt can't afford it. And here's the shock delinquent, delinquency rates go up. So, you know, I, I think that it's a, it's a tough situation. Let's add some. When I make soup, by the way, honestly, if you want a great chicken soup, I make the best effing chicken soup you've ever. No bullshit. No, I'm, all right, I'm in. Maybe we'll, what do they call those show notes thing, Dan? Show notes. Give show your notes. recipe. <laughs> Maybe you have your recipe. You're gonna put your funny. recipe I on might there. Put the recipe in the show notes. All right. So I'm gonna add some carrots to this discussion because that's. What Are we gonna get more positive? You don't put Benny, dill. Is there? No. Don't tell me there's I'm dill. Not, I'm dill just is not it, saying it's. I not feel. I feel like if, if people are still listening at this point, no, I'm just gonna be positive. I feel like we need to do something positive. Dill, can we all no, agree I'm on just this? Just adding more. Uh, I, more I don't, soup. No, dill is a noxious weed. Noxious. It should weed. not go in food. I don't. I don't use dill. There are a couple secret ingredients that I'll put. in. What do they call those things? Show notes. We haven't even. We we said it once, but I'm gonna say it again. As Danny mentioned last week, and he's mentioned a number of times, the largest holder of our treasuries, Japan, Japan, Bef- and good for them, by the way. But they've been you know, selling for ten what'd years. You, what'd you say? What'd I'm you sorry, they've been they, selling for what? what? They've been selling for ten. What years. What were you no, singing a couple weeks ago? Um, control, control. That's Another stuff. Jackson, Janet exactly. Jackson. Exactly. See? Jackson. It's all, oh, see the way Jana I weave Jackson. the narrative. Yeah, yield curve control. Well, they have yeah. lost control. Yes. And now the yen is weakening. Their bond yields are going higher. They're, they are selling treasuries here, I think. We won't know for another month. Well, I'm pretty yes, sure they are, I'm which sure means too. our yields continue to go higher. The yen continues to weaken. That ain't good. And dollar yen's now at levels we last saw, I think, in the fall. And oh, by the way, Tony, yuan continues to weaken to levels we saw in August of 2015. That wasn't particularly good either. Thoughts on that? It's a bad setup. Bad setup. But, but here's just, you know. It's already happened to a lot, a lot of stocks because this has been the magnificent seven or any stupid marketing oh. thing we want to pull up. The average stock has been smoked. You've still got more than 50% of the S&P down more 20% from their 52-week high. So it's not new news that, that the economy is going to be in trouble. We're watching it in real time with the, the retailers lately. There's three right. stocks actually that just keep like grabbing my attention. You can just lump them all together. It's Disney, which is about to make a new multi-year low here. It's Starbucks, which can't get out of its own way. It's Nike, which actually like, like, so all those stocks look like they're just, and so what does that say? They're not like that aspirational of a consumer discretionary, but they're, you know what I mean? They're they're, they're telling you the soft landing's not happening. They're telling you that the Fed is wrong. Yeah. They're telling... Real America is telling you that it's not what the data is showing. But you know what's interesting, Tony? All of those results that we've heard from those three companies over the last two months or so, none of them were that bad. And none of the guidance was that bad. So it's not that the companies are saying it. It's investors in those names are speaking with their wallets. You know what I'm saying in a way? And it's just, I guess the point, and it goes back to what we started this conversation, why you just called them the Mag 7 or whatever, why we're spending so much time on these cult stocks that are trillion dollar stocks is they really do hold the fate of the stock market. Because once once what's going on with Starbucks and Nike 
and Disney permeates its way to some of these other names that are not as consumer facing for the most part, because you could look at it the other way. You could say, well, Amazon, I just saw what their margins were in their retail business, you know, that after they've been suffering for a long time. But guy, you and I had this conversation on Fast Money there, and we were talking about some of these really poor retail earnings, specifically like a Macy's and a Kohl's and some of these, and Target, which was, you know, not particularly great or whatever. But Amazon might start flexing again. They might have the logistics and the last mile and all that stuff in a way that makes their um, offering that much more attractive than a bricks and mortar. So I guess we have to kind of drill down on some of the names, but my point is that those three stocks that we just mentioned, I think they are telling a story. But they have something in common. And part of that, although they're old traditional companies, is China. They're big there, all of them. Uh, and I believe that's the one thing that, Tony, that I think that, you know, Guy just mentioned about the Wan and China is a serious situation. Yeah, it's serious. And it is because everything in China is about the real estate market. And the reason everything's about the real estate market is you build these communities to get people out of poverty into the middle class, right? They put down deposits to do it. Lo and behold, the companies that we're building them are going bankrupt. And the money that's being managed of these assets themselves are are going, you know, are dropping precipitously and they're not paying their interest anymore. Yeah. And so it's having this unvirtuous cycle, I guess, if you want to say it's, it's also not unique. Like it happened with Japan and, and but China has been the China has been the one thing we can count on, and it's still growing. Yeah. So it's not growing as fast. But I believe to Dan, you know, makes a comment of those three type companies. They've been you know very dependent, at least for you know years, on kind of growth, growth, growth in in China mm -hmm. to a degree. And I I think that's part of it that's being overlooked because we're so obsessed with what's happening here. So but I it, and as important as that is, Danny, because it's a hundred percent right. The global economy is not great. I think what's really being um, not overlooked too much is the is we're at full employment. Mm -hmm. The consumer's in great shape. Well, okay, hold on. Which, okay, but so, I and my pushback ahead. on that is it always is right before you have a credit issue and it spikes. And it's when you spike, it happens fast. The unemployment goes down on an escalator and up on a rocket. And it happens because all of a sudden the top line fails. People that, that do what I do get the whole margin stuff wrong. It's never about higher cost. Mm -hmm. It's always about when your top line fails. And we're watching that in real time with some of these retailers where their margins are at pressure because their top line is coming down because you can't cut cost as fast well, as your revenue drops. And the retailers that have private label credit cards that have now delinquency spiking, charge-offs, like it's happening in real time. I'll tell you, Guy, before you comment on this, so... To me, it's all about consumer credit because it's a, it's a consumer-driven economy, and we know where credit card debt is right now. We know what people are paying on it if they're not paying their monthly bills. We know it's jacking up north of 20% here, and you got to carry that. But I always call Vinny because Vinny is the credit guy. He inputs numbers. Unbelievable. He, Dude, right? unbelievable. But he knows. So I always call him. He goes, he goes yes, because he knows why I'm calling. I'm like, is that credit? Is that bad? He goes, it'll say sometimes, Danny, it's normal. I go, what do you mean normal? He goes, it's seasonal. It always does this and this and that. Lately, when I've been calling, I'm like, is that bad? He's like, yes, that's bad. That's, so there's been a shift. There is. There is what? a shift it, happening. It, so. And that, and to me, that the bull story for everything has not been China. Is, yeah, you got to look. No, it's the consumer. It's the U.S. It's consumer. It's about the consumers in great shape because services, we were stuck in our homes. We bought stuff. And then we transitioned to doing, that was our call in early 2022, is the economy was going to transition from buying stuff to doing stuff. And, and that got as extreme as the buying stuff did because they gave you lots of money and 0% financing. Now that, ha unfortunately, we, we did a lot of stuff. Time to take a break. I have my theory as to what scares the U.S. consumer into stop spending. What do you think scares the U.S. consumer? What's out there that everything's fine right now, markets is what it is, it's not really doing much. U.S. consumer will always, their want to spend is always there. Whether they should be or not, that's a different conversation. What scares them into stopping? What makes them slow is interest rates and restriction from credit. The idea that you might not get money to borrow if you want to. What makes them stop is you lose your job. So an unemployment rate that starts to trend higher in a nonlinear way. It's, it's interesting. You know, I do think, you know, say what you want about the Fed. I think we all know where I come down on this. I still think the same way they thought they could control inflation, which they clearly couldn't, I think it's the same way they think they can control the unemployment rate, which they which won't they be can. able to. Because once that genie's out of the bottle, it's going to start to cascade on them. So let so again, three stages. You want to sell when good news is bad news because you know the Fed's in front of you. To me, you look to buy. You're, you're cautious. You have cash. You're defensive. But you look to buy when bad news becomes bad news. When, you're, when your scenario plays out, my scenario as well, and the unemployment rate spikes, 
Inflation's going to come down fast. It did in the 70s. It had major downticks mm -hmm. in the 70s. And if that's true, inflation's not your problem. Employment's your problem. And that, that ultimately is what creates that buying opportunity that, that gets me to be, you know, the permable for X number of years before credit becomes an issue again. This is human nature, cyclical stuff. So let's talk about sectors because you break things down, small, mid, sure. large. Let's find some positives in here. So what looks good to you? What's flashing kind of green, so to speak, that you would put your money in? Right on, on an absolute basis, honestly, okay, let's talk about the earnings yield. Again, macro, and then we'll go mm -hmm. into the into the sectors. The earnings yield on the, the current consensus estimate for S&P operating earnings is $245 next year. By the way, it was $250 for 2023 <laughs> in July of last year. Right. It's now $219. So, um, on an earnings yield basis, and for the people that don't know what that is, it's just an inverse of the PE. So you can compare it directly to the risk-free rate or treasuries. So the earnings yield on that number, I think is a, a five and a 5.25 or something like that. Um, you can get better than that in the risk-free mm -hmm. rate. So why, even on the optimistic consensus number, would you do that? Why would you take the risk at a historically high multiple, historically levered system and, and not take that risk-free rate? So that's where we are from a macro level. And because of that, I think the idea that you're going to have this magnificent seven, the grade eight, however, the top 10 stocks currently make up 32% of the S&P 500. And I've often said, this is an academic analysis. This is common sense. I would never tell anybody to have 30% of their portfolio that's stock-based in 10 stocks. Well, they're all the same stock too. I mean, if you think about like the, like the, a lot of their characteristics. But let's but you, but you don't yeah. even have to go there. It's yes, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a nifty fifty of the seventies. Yeah. The last yeah. time give me some positive, the number Tony. was that high was in the early seventies. <laughs> Tony, give me some positive. I'm, I'm, so here's I'm, the positive. Okay. <laughs> if it is a levered system and and the unemployment rate spikes, the Fed will get much more aggressive than people think, much quicker than they think. Just like after Silicon Valley Bank happened, and it's that point that if you're down, the average stock is already down more than 20% from its 52 week high, then it's giddy up time. So to me, what I'm advising our institutional and wealth management clients is don't try to play the downside. Don't try to bet on the downside. We know it's there. Everybody in the universe sees it. And typically it's right. It takes longer than you think. But when that weakness comes, you attack it because it'll cause a drop in rates, an improved outlook for money. So the question I always get is, what will get you bullish? Because now I had somebody stop me on the street, like enough of the doom and gloom, Dwyer, right? Which usually it's like enough of the bullishness. But anyway, what would get me to change is very simple. If you don't get that downside, Danny, what would make me change is if you see corporate yields in an absolute basis come down dramatically. If mortgage rates come down dramatically, that spread compresses um, between the 10-year and the high yield debt market. And when the Fed starts to aggressively ease, it improves the outlook for money that enables you to look through the coming economic weakness. What, one thing that drives me a little bit nuts, well, one thing, there's so many things as you guys know, um, is me too. when people like me come on and they talk about the corporate spreads are tighter. Okay, tell a CFO that's gone from paying three and three quarters on high yield debt to eight and three quarters on high yield debt that the spreads are tighter and it's all good. Like that, you haven't, if you look, just look at, for the listeners and viewers, look at three things. This is all I'm looking at. I'll give it out to you. It's corporate rates, mortgage rates, government rates. I can't find a soft landing scenario or an economic weak, weak period where higher of all three of them was a good thing. Typically, they're coming down pretty aggressively. 1966, 1995, plus all the recessions. So just to be clear, your bullish call if things have to get so bad that the Fed's going to cut 100 basis points and we start buying, yeah, they're I just to want to make sure that we're yeah, on the yeah, same page. Yeah. So things are going to get, I, that is, I think it's interesting, but think about what Tony's saying. Things have to get shitty enough or something has to break in order for the Fed to come in once again and save the day. And then it's all, the party's on for but equities. They which to, it's levered. It, it, they it's have interesting. To. They, There's no choice. How do you how do you yeah. fix you can't fix a levered system with exponentially more debt? I'm looking here on Fed Fund Futures. I'm not sure exactly if these are being calculated correctly, but we've gone up on the chance of another rate hike, In not September, down. Correct. Yeah. And it's gone up here and the chances of a rate cut as we're sitting here and watching this market is actually getting pushed out slightly. So 
this I don't is, know. No, I'm South saying that's a worst case scenario. Yeah, no. Well, this so is you're looking mistake. at the CME Fed fund tracker. So, so uh, the other day it had a 15 percent chance of a 25 basis point. Hike. It's now over 17. I'm just saying it's okay, not a dramatic. Right. Again, I'm sure it trades. You know, it's not yeah, a yeah. but it was 10 percent. It was 10 percent, 12 percent a day ago. So if the market goes down 10 percent, and those three things don't get fixed, I'll have the same opinion. If the market goes up 10 percent. And those three things don't get fixed. I'll have the same opinion. All right. So let me let me ask. What is where is the Fed? So this is something I've said again. This is just my. I'm not suggesting anything. I think if the Fed put we're in the equity market, which I no longer think it is, but if it is, it's somewhere around 3,800 or so, which is 17 or 1,400, 1,500 S&P handles from where we currently are. So that's not relevant. The Fed put comes in the form of two things. I think the unemployment rate, which you just sort of addressed. I think it's closer to maybe 5%, but maybe 45 is the number, or some sort of credit event happens, which I think is more likely. What say you on the credit side of things? You see anything whatsoever that would indicate there's a credit event coming? There's always a credit event. Every recession has a credit event. If I remember one of my first jobs on Wall Street was a 1990 recession when Thompson McKinnon got acquired by or melted into Prudential Beige, where I was at the time. That was the credit event was the, I think, do you remember, was that mortgage rates or some, some mortgage based paper because of the spike in rates. Then you had the great, uh, then you had the dot-com bust, but it was also the CLEX and telecom debt and some of the crazy stuff that, that Danny was mentioning earlier. And then you had the great financial crisis. It always comes with a credit event. Mm -hmm. Now what's been a, there's, but there's also a buffer. Every cycle, there's something new. And what's new is the explosion of private credit and private equity because they don't have a cost of cat. They have a risk-free rate of return. They can't go under the risk-free rate of return, but there isn't, they're paid to take the money, mm -hmm. right? There's no yield curve. So they can come in. If the spread 70 cents is from the seller to 30 cents is a traditional buyer, they can come in at 50 because they don't have the yeah, cost yeah, but of cat. Last fall though, b this was the, the Blackstone, you know, the, the real estate, you know, fund. There was, there was gates put up. There was runs on that. I mean, my, my point yeah, is all it, this it stuff starts to snowball it away in, in a period of some sort of stress. So we could say that really casually now. I mean, put it this way, on our iConnection segment that we do on Mondays uh, on the pod, we've had four private credit guys on. That's not something we were doing in 2021 or that, 2022. It's just a new player. No, I know, I know. By the way, they don't get everything right either. Just uh, so we're no, on no, the same and, and, and it's, it's unregulated yeah. new player. No, you're, that, then that's another big part too, right? And so if you think about the transfer that we saw from these regional mm -hmm. banks, you just said it yourself, right? To these more, less regulated, I guess you would say, players who are buying th those distressed sort of assets in a way. Danny, I mean, let me let me throw a quick stat at you that I got from Matt Sober. Somebody emailed it to me and I'll give the credit. I always give credit to people that put it out. It was tweeted. Is that called doxing? It was oxed. It, it, it was, it, it, it was on credit. And it, it showed a chart of, Hat tip. of the public, public company since 2002 has gone from just under 5,000 to just over 4,000 today. The private equity funded companies has gone from just under 5,000 to over 15,000. So think about what that means. Are the best companies even going public? So we're dealing with well, they'd like to go public. I mean, like that, that, you know, that, that, listen, they have to go public. We know this because the early why? investors, they need exits, right? And so, you know, when you think you just named Celex and all this stuff from the 90s, we were trading those things like crazy. They were fun. They all went out of business. You know what I mean? Uh, and like, 100%. you know, theory. so it, it, yeah, but I'm going to go back because the banks are no longer here to provide a buffer really in any capacity. So to take assets from a client yeah, to, right. and let's not forget who lends to private equity. It's the banks, right? They're the ones that are providing credit lines. They're the ones that are providing financing on some yeah, of these. Yeah, but pensions are- per No, I understand yeah. what you're saying. I'm just saying, we're saying that private credit is replacing, you know, the ba but banks, but the banks are massive. They were endless oh, yeah. okay. last cycle. I mean, there was no end. They were using depositors' money, obviously, is what is what we saw. So I just, I just think that, you know, things are going to get really disjointed. And when the banks aren't intermediaries, it's very different than having private credit. What do I mean? I was talking about the talking about this the last few weeks, terms of leverage are going to come down in the system because banks that lend to hedge funds and credit funds, yeah. they're going to ask, they're going to go from 5X to 3X. And when they do that, this is when you see these types of moves. This is when you see treasuries yeah. move like this globally. This is when you see currencies. This is what happens. And so I'm a believer that if you're asking, and we didn't even talk about, it, there have been blowups already. It's commercial real estate. It's happening. Oh, it's happening. I mean, it, it's, it's massive. It's actually happening in, in retail. It, in real time, right? And <laughs> so 
all these things, I go back to one thing and one thing only. It's just in 2008, all the, all the government programs, and we never paid the price that we were supposed to pay. And I'm, and I'm really upset that I'm sitting here today again, finding myself not in an echo chamber, but going back down this road because I swear, whether people want to believe it or not, I come in here each week and I literally try to find green shoots of things. You're laughing at me, guy. It's true. And I can't get past. I can't, I can't, I have to be genuine in what I'm seeing. Yeah. And it is not going to be pretty. I'll say it again. There are stocks you're going to be able to own. To your point, Fed starts cutting. There's probably mortgage REITs out there that have hedged correctly that there's going to be great opportunities. So get ready. So get ready. And you don't sell your quality stocks. You don't have to. They're the dividend down. Bank, they're Lots down. You hang in there. So don't panic, but don't own shit. All right, let's, let's just hit one thing here. Um, John Butters, our friend over Butters. at Fact Site. Uh, By the Fact way, Site. it's like Butters. Butters, we've made Butters into- You have. No, we. <laughs> so John <laughs> Butters over at Fact Site. He's just Butters. Earnings Insight Great. blog there. He's been so, on vacation. So he has been on vacation. But you know, he, he tracks basically, Tony, your 245 number for next year. No, that's, that's not my number. That's asking. consensus. I'm 220. Okay. So do, <laughs> See, I told you he was bullish. So, 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 but that's for next year. And so that's, yeah. that's flat-ish of what consensus is right now. If that's right? the number. The market's going to get killed. Please continue. Okay. But I just like, 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 like if we just do a little math here, 4385 divided by 220, right? You have a 20 forward PE. On the S and P five hundred, and okay, like so five and so five. so Butters tracks the average. Obviously, you know eighteen and a half over the last five years, seventeen and a half over the last ten years or so. My question to you right now, at twenty times forward, your number, okay, what is the stock market discounting right now? Because we've just laid out. We didn't. We we spent a little time on China. Uh, we didn't really even talk about Europe. Um, you know, we're talking about what's going on higher for longer for yields and the like here. What is a twenty S and P on a forward of your estimate discounting right now? I think it's discounting a reduction in inflation coupled with full employment for as far as the eye can see. And so no, really no rosy scenarios issues. is it's, what you're it, saying. Oh, well, there's no question. But that's a no landing scenario, correct? Is, is that what we're so agreeing on here? How do you know in a room of a thousand people who the pilot is? You don't have to guess. We'll tell you. I'm a pilot. <laughs> and, you know, I need gas. <laughs> like, there's no such thing as a no landing or soft landing. You need gas, so you could f you could figure it out. Get near an airport if you're going to do a soft landing. By the way, did you see this? <laughs> did you see this show on Apple Plus Hijack? With I did. Idris Elba. I saw that it. was good. It was good. Pilot didn't fare so well in that one. Spoiler alert: You should watch. Guy, you got but, me. But, but the whole the whole point here is that this is this thing happens fast, guys. When it goes sideways, it go. People forget in the middle of 08, it was, I believe, July or August of 08, you were retesting the high in a lot of stocks. Credit was on fire because the Fed had came in, bailed out Bear Stearns by the acquisition of JP Morgan. Credit default swaps were, were coming down hard and it looked like it was going to be I don't like know if that happened in July. Okay. I think it was, there was a big rally in the May. Summer of, it, yeah, no, oh, it, was in, it was in late spring though. But okay. the summer, let, let me tell you something. I was on a trading desk at the derivatives desk at Merrill Lynch. It felt like Armageddon all summer long. Yeah, it was you terrible. I mean? like, so the summer that felt knew. really bad. <laughs> that we're advising the people that right, didn't let's, know. Let's do a little vibe check here because I know Danny said I'm trying. He wanted some positives. What that? Wanted to hear some somebody's stuff baby. How did we feel? But, but this that's last that's the positive somebody's stuff. Baby. <laughs> that's the positive stuff. You What's have that the to get song it bad to? enough to that's, kickstart money. That is from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Sung by. By the way. Jackson Brown. Thank you. By the way, Dan, without even realizing it, you said a rosy scenario. Rosy, by the way, is a song on Running on Empty. I won't tell the fans what the song is about. Rosie, also an amazing guest, just like Tony Dwyer, Rosenberg. David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Well, let's, let's do a vibe check. Let, okay. let, what did we feel? What did, I mean, what, did we try to try to be constructive here? No, I depressed myself today, actually. So I, I, I literally- <laughs> That's hard to do. No, wow. that's hard to do about this because I feel like today, I don't know where the market is right now. We're heading into the close. I haven't looked. On the lows. Okay. July 26, 2000, feels like what's going to be down is August 24th, 2023 is kind of the day. I think the day was July 18th, as Dan pointed out, the day that Microsoft announced their AI pricing and all this crap. That was kind of a seminal day. This feels like another one. And I, you know, I don't know who the incremental buyer is of things. And I said before, if I'm running a hedge fund right now and I'm up in the teens somehow, so I'm going literally, I know you can't go to cash, but you're going to cash like securities at this point. Because to your point, Tony, you just made, which is a good one, my risk adjusted return or whatever, what are my alternatives to doing long. this? It's just right. Short or long. Short so or long. again, again, it's just, it's just, I just feel like we have to undo 
15 years of this shit. All right, so here's the deal. So we were right, 10 minutes into the close on Thursday, and NVIDIA, which was up, I think, 10% in the pre-market, is up 40 basis points. Okay, so it it's actually about to go. traded unchanged at one point over the last half hour, so okay, that's not important. Right, right. Please continue. So, so, so I think you've lost leadership, okay? So that's one of the things. And so by the time you're listening to this, you will have already heard what, what Jerome Powell had to say, okay? I think the setup into it, it sounded um, a bit hawkish by some of the trial balloons that were floated. And so maybe that becomes the base case scenario, but let's see. I really feel like we're about to kind of hit one of those periods, Tony, that you're talking about, where a lot of the volatility and other risk assets are going to feed their way into our equity markets a little bit. And I think that's going to happen here. Just, Guy, before we get to you, I just want to do a little housekeeping. I like housekeeping. A little I've housekeeping. mentioned my favorite housekeeper was Hazel. Hazel Booth, if you recall, <laughs> she was a great housekeeper. If it's you recall, another so. housekeeper, do you remember this? Um, From the Brady Bunch, Ann B. Davis? Ann B. Davis. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Anyway, Ann I don't B. know Davis. where you're going with this. All right, guys, on yeah. Monday, if you're listening to this on Friday Mr. French. or Saturday or Sunday, that means you can tune in on noon. Guy and I are doing the market call. We do it on Sirius XM Radio. That's Business Channel 132, 12 noon, 9 a.m. Pacific time. You can call in. 844-942-7866. And Liz Young. Stop it. EY from SoFi will be on with us live in studio. And you she's the best. And you can call, you can ask, you can ask Guy about his Giants. Ask me whatever you want. You can ask him about his Yankees. No, you, you can, can ask, ask Liz what about I her Brewers. Ask me whatever you want. All right. I give you an honest call answer. In the noon Eastern Monday, 844-942-7866. That's Market Call on Sirius XM Business Radio. Guy and I will be there with Liz Young. Also... I had a great conversation. This is going to drop Monday morning on our On The Tape podcast drop. Guy, you would have loved this. Chad Anderson, he's a managing partner at Space Capital. He's the author of Space Economy. It's a book. It's actually fascinating. I've been digging into it. And it's not just sci-fi stuff. He's talking about investing in the space sure. economy. And it's a lot of stuff that we interact with. on a day. You as a pilot, Tony, there's a lot of technology in your plane and stuff like that. So here's the deal. That pod's going to drop on Monday on the On The Tape podcast. And we're doing a giveaway for that book book the first 100 people to leave a review for on the tape and okay computer in the podcast store you know what to do screenshot them take a picture send it to contact at riskversal.com to amanda obviously sure. she, her inbox loves that stuff maybe you get it on the tape calendar 2020 <laughs> oh, let's do it on the tape calendar <laughs> wow. for 2024 get, get, get your calendar you have a bathing suit get on? your oh, calendar right, so do all of that people yeah. all right guy well, what's Danny your vibe check what's your Danny vibe would check be here? the july Port. That's I right. can't wait for guys' vibe. Check. I'm guy. What's your vibe? <laughs> check? What's your vibe check? What's going on? Here, so guy? here's my vibe check. Yeah. Okay. Remember, I said I don't know when that road turned on to the road I'm on. I've been on this road for quite some time. It's been a bumpy effing road. There've been potholes along the way. Been traffic jams along the way. Sometimes I'm the only one on the fucking road <laughs> by myself, and I find myself talking to myself. But I'm like, I see clarity. Like I see where the road is going, but. There are only a handful of people that are on that same road or see that. Now I feel as if, as I started the show, the road that people are on is turning on to the road that I've been on all along. So my vibe check is maybe I'm not a fucking wacko after all. How's that, Dan Nate? Can I say Please. one thing before Please. Tony gives his final vibe yeah, and hopefully it's yeah. something positive is if you're in a stock and you're down money in it, from an opportunity cost perspective, don't let that be the reason that you're not selling it because it's the one thing that makes charts work. And it's why charts work is because it gets to a level, hits its head. Car There's a reason it hits its head at a certain level because, oh, I got my money back. I'm getting out. Don't be a schmuck. Like if, if the stock's, if stock's going to lower, don't worry about getting your money back. That whole concept makes has never made sense to me, right? It's so anyway, I wanted just to add that in because on a money management basis, go put it in something else and go get your 5% back over the course of a year, Tony. Does Tony get the vibe check, Dan? Of course. What's your, what's your vibe? Take us check, out of Tony? here, Tony. Take us out of here. Well, I'm not going to sing because the Dwyer family no, is not no. allowed to <laughs> sing or dance in public. It's a social rule. Please, fair um, enough. No, I'm kidding. My kids are. I'm, I'm not. Um, the vibe check is it's it's really great to be with you guys, and and really ultimately, it's the point where we're looking for opportunity, even and that opportunity always comes from some kind of economically based credit event that things are trending that way. We saw how quickly the Fed has learned how to act because of all the experience that we all have with great financial crisis. They will act fast. They will blow. Just go back and look at the Fed funds rate in the 70s. If you want to wonder how fast they'll act, look at that chart. And at that point, 
I think that's going to create an opportunity to be, have a more sustainable body. I just, they're running out of acronyms, Tony. I don't know what, what acronyms are left to be used that they have a program, which they haven't named yet, but maybe you, we can help them decode something. So. <laughs> All right. Tony Dwyer, Can Accord Genuity. Thank you for I being love, here can with I just say, Tony. Am I allowed to say something? It's your podcast. We've had <laughs> most of Tony's, to, they're, it's like. My favorite song, one of my favorite Zeppelin songs, is all my life. One voice is clear above the din. Yeah. I use that expression. Every once Basically, in a while. means every once in a while, a voice just rises above all the cacophony of sound that you hear. Tony Dwyer is a voice that rises above the din. Danny He's got Moses. guts. If you're short on the sell side, you got guts. You better be right. So you got moxie. No. Here. <laughs> What's that no, from? We're not ending it on that, Danny. Sorry, I'm no. not short. Oh, right. You're. I'm you're, light and tight. You're right. That means. I, now, all right, can I say one thing? And I thought sure. I was in the shower yeah. this morning, and Close you know, up. and it was like you know seven ten, and and you know I of were course, you like Ray Liotta in Goodfellas in the we, shower? No, can, I don't no, want to hear more no, about there's this. No, there's, there's, no more, there's no more detail about <laughs> me being in the shower. Other than, that, but I was thinking, you know, and I and I, I and at the time, Nvidia was up like eight and a half percent sure. in the pre market. Of course, I'm logs and puts, logs and puts, and everything like that. And I said, if I, and I heard, I saw a headline that the last sell rating on the stock, Take okay, there was like 40, the took neutral. it off. And I said, you know what, man, if any of these guys had any balls, if they're at a they big shop, red. they would wake up this morning and they'd be like, I love this company. I've been right on the, the, the secular trend. Pulling the ripcord. it. You know what I mean? And not a single one of these guys, and they're all guys, I think, for the most part. Did, but it's well, just you know what? Unfortunately, me. guys, it's all, Wall Street has become made for TV. And it becomes, you know, the gotcha world where you go on and it's whether you're right or wrong. Mm. Guys, you cannot discern whether you're right or wrong at a point in time. Because if you go from last Correct. August to currently, market's down. Yeah, but if it's made for TV, then you better have your moments on TV. That's one thing I've learned doing CNBC right. for 13 years. You know what I mean? Like, so my point is, is like, you know, and we're still here and, and I don't think we're doing it for the cameras and everything like that. We're calling it the way we see it. So my point is, which is, is if I was, you guys. but if I was working at some shop that had ratings and bullshit price targets and all this sort of stuff, I'd make my points known because like, you know, you had an amazing opportunity. 1.2, uh, no, excuse me, $120 billion have been shaved off of NVIDIA since I was in the shower at 7.10 this morning, okay? Like, into the close right now. It's going to close. You know what I mean? So, like, my point is, is like, that's a that's an epic opportunity. If you're a sell-side analyst, you could make a career on a $100 billion move in a stock, right? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. You know what? It shouldn't be lost on anybody to do it. We're here to help. Yeah. We're here to give good input. Try to make people see that's a positive. You know, that's the well, there we we're go. End on a, all right, Tony Dwyer, thank you for coming down. Buddy. <laughs> thank Thanks you for so having much. me. You right, guys let's do it greatest. again really soon, Tony. I love Thanks, it. man. And the scene that I was referring to, by the way, <laughs> when Ray Leo was in the shower and the Lufthoff, he heard yes. the Lufthansa oh, yeah. heist on 10 10 wins. It was the, it was the but, but mine was the opposite. Well, no, you want to hear? Can I say one more thing? Absolutely. It's your podcast. When I was new in media, because I do TV because I love to be able to interact with public. I was told by 1010 10 Wins, you'll never make it in the media. You Stop don't have it. a voice for it. Swear to God, they wouldn't let me go on 1010 10 Wins when really? Larry Wachtel was, was sick. Karen, you didn't <laughs> sell the NVIDIA? Karen, that's all we had, Karen. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I went on that. All right, all right. Guys. thanks, guys. Thanks, all right, Tony. Thank you, guys.